Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I always like to begin by thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support my podcast on Patreon and extending a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors patron family. Visit patreon.com slash talking tutors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor themed goodies, you'll have access to patron only monthly giveaways. April's prize is a copy of the Carnival of Ash. A huge thank you to Solaris Books for sponsoring this great prize. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly talks that take place on Zoom. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I would love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag ILoveTalkingTudors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Henry VII and the 1486 royal progress is Sarah Morris. Sarah is an author, blogger, and podcaster, better known online as the Tudor Travel Guide. She's committed to ensuring that Tudor history lovers everywhere can relish their immersion into the past, with all the facts and hard-to-find details needed to time travel at their fingertips. She's also now one of the most trusted providers of travel information for exploring Tudor locations all over the UK. Alongside a very active Instagram account, Sarah provides both information and inspiration to countless Tudor connoisseurs across the globe who are looking to travel to the UK to plan their in-person Tudor-themed road trips via travel itineraries, events, tours, blogs, podcasts and videos. Our conversation is coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. <laughs> Welcome to Talking Tudors, Sarah. How are you? I'm very well, Natalie. It's a pleasure to be back here with you chatting and talking Tudors once again. I mean, it's we don't do it at all, do we? No, no, <laughs> we never do that. And you know what? I was just thinking today, preparing and thinking about our talk, that you were the first podcast episode I ever did. It was Sarah and Natalie, the Sarah and Natalie show. And that was almost five years ago, Sarah. Can you believe that? Wow. No, no, I can't. I was I was most honoured. I remembered you saying, oh, I'm thinking of setting up this podcast called Talking Tudors. Do you mind if you come along and be my first guest? And we had a ball and uh, as we always do when we get together. Absolutely. So we're, we're talking today. We're going to talk about progresses. But before we do that, do you mind just saying hello to everyone and just giving everyone a little bit of info about you and your background? Yeah, of course. Hello, everyone. A pleasure to be here uh, chatting with you today. So yes, I'm Sarah Morris, and I'm also better known around the Tudor sphere, as I call it, as the Tudor Travel Guide. Uh, So I started the Tudor Travel Guide, about I think it was 2018. Uh, I've been a lover of Tudor history all my life. I had written some books by that point. Uh, My novel in two volumes, Le Ton Viandre, a novel of Anne Boleyn, hot on the heels, followed by Arthur's collaboration in the footsteps of Anne Boleyn and then of course in the footsteps of the six wives of Henry VIII and then I took a little breather 
Um, I thought I would take some time out, but of course, you know, those pesky Tudors, they can't leave you alone. And my love of the Tudors and the writing called me back to start this new venture, the Tudor Travel Guide, which is is really all about my love of visiting Tudor places. Um, you and I, Natalie, have said so many times that it's only time and not space that separates us from the past. And I've been visiting Tudor places since I was knee high to a grasshopper. And I love sharing stories of those locations with people because I think when we go and visit a place or we learn more about a place in which an event happened, we see it with new eyes and it brings a new sense of a deeper connection and a richness to the story. And I love doing that for myself and I love sharing that with people. So the Tudor Travel Guide is all about helping people learn more about Tudor history through the lens of the places in which people lived and events unfolded and hopefully inspiring people along the way to go and visit them. Absolutely. And, you know, I love that. And I love Tudor progresses as well. But so why did you feel like writing more about them? We obviously wrote about them for our books and our collaborations. So so why did you turn back to the, the Tudor progress? Well, I think I was bitten by the bug in our writing about the 1535 progress for In the Footsteps of Anne Boleyn. We decided to write about it, a whole section on it, because it was so complete and such a historic progress. And I found it illuminating, Natalie, I think, in a way that I hadn't anticipated. I think when you follow a Tudor figure over a period of time, you start to feel as though you get a much deeper understanding of them. You see how they carry themselves, you see more of their character, you see more of the decisions that they make over a sustained period of time. Whenever I have done that, I've been so surprised at the new insights that sort of present themselves not just about the places that I research, which are delightful in and of themselves because I get the opportunity to go and visit them when I'm researching them. And that's that's always creates a huge amount of excitement. But I've never failed to come away feeling that I know the person I've been following so much more intimately. So um, you know that I've been hankering after writing a book on specifically on Tudor progresses for a long time. However, I know you'll also appreciate this, Natalie, the life of the blogger is no quiet one. And there's always a myriad of things to do. And it's so difficult to carve the time to write a book when you are recording podcasts, doing YouTube videos, managing all the admin stuff you need to do, writing blogs, etc. And so I was looking for a way in which I could return to that love and that passion, kind of in a way that would hold me to account to writing. And, and actually, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit more at the end. But I've recently uh, launched my new membership site, The Ultimate Guide to Exploring Tudor England, which pulls together all of my best content across uh, blogs and podcasts and videos. And one component of that is that I have dedicated myself to writing about Tudor progresses throughout the Tudor period. And so this one, the 1486 progress that we're going to be talking about today, is the first of those that I've been tackling as part of the membership. Fantastic. And I suppose, you know, the Tudors went on progress almost every every year. All the Tudor monarchs did it. It was a very important political tool as well as just getting out there and having fun and seeing what everyone's doing, keeping an eye on people. So how did you decide which progress to write about? Obviously, we've written about the 1535 progress, but there's so many other years to choose from. So how, how did you make that decision? Yeah, you're right. I mean, we'd spent a lot of time immersed in the world of Henry VIII and his glamorous six wives, hadn't we? And uh, in the process, probably neglecting some of the other Tudor monarchs. I certainly felt that way. And particularly, I think, Henry VII, who I think historically has sort of been rather overlooked in favour of the more dramatic storyline associated with his son and his queen consorts. And I certainly was guilty of that. And I was intrigued to know more. And so I had two things in my mind. A, I, I always want to follow my passion, a little bit selfishly maybe, but I was curious. I wanted to know more about him. But I also had this thing about I want to cover 
you know, I want to start by covering at least one progress from every single reign. And I thought, well, why not start at the beginning, which, of course, was the very first Tudor progress, the progress that took place the year after Henry won the crown at Bosworth. And so I thought that's where I'm going first. I'm diving in. OK, so you chose 1486 because you're wanting to learn more about Henry and those early locations that the Tudors visited. Got it. Fantastic. So following the Battle of Bosworth, which places were most associated with Henry's first few months as monarch and why do you think he chose those particular locations? Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit out with the 1486 progress, but I just find it interesting to know what happened as soon as Henry Tudor left that blood-soaked battlefield at Bosworth. So, and also it sets the context a little bit for what's going to come with the 1486 progress. But of course, he made his way to London straight away. He had to secure the capital news had spread that he'd slain Richard III on the battlefield. There was a new monarch in England. I think there was, you know, uh, obviously a sense of unease in the capital. So Henry headed there straight away. And one of the things, actually, that, again, because I'm so used to being in the world of Henry VIII and thinking about places like Greenwich and Hampton Court and Whitehall. I was thinking, where did he go? Because, you know, some of them weren't, they they weren't the royal palaces they would become. So um, for those people who are interested, of course, Henry came straight away. He was met at Shoreditch. He went to St. Paul's Cathedral. He presented the three banners that he'd uh, had at the Battle of Bosworth Field at the altar there. And then he really initially set up base at the uh, Bishop's Palace, which is directly adjacent to St. Paul's Cathedral. So one of the most luxurious um, houses in London, part of the citadel of old St. Paul's. And in fact, of course, that's where the infamous marital a liaison between his son Arthur and Catherine did or did not take place (laughs) several years later. So he established himself there at Bishop of London's palace and then shortly after transferred very short distance to uh, Baynard's Castle, which only really recently appreciated Natalie was the kind of the mirror opposite of the Tower of London. So the Tower of London was built to protect the east side of the city of London and Baynard's was built to protect the west side. So that was a beautiful palatial complex connected to the, you know, celebrated friary of Blackfriars. And anybody who knows anything about their, again, their later Tudor history will appreciate the importance of the Blackfriars trial in the King's Great Matter with Catherine and Aragon giving her famous speech there. After spending some time at Baynard's Castle, he transferred via the river to the Palace of Westminster, which had been the centre of royal power since the early medieval period. Of course, eventually, in the early years of the reign of Henry VIII, there would be um, a kind of devastating fire at the palace, which forced Henry to move locations to some of those other palaces that we know, Greenwich Palace and and later Whitehall, etc. So I'm quite interested in the fact that Henry VII spent time in some of those places in London that his late the later Tudor monarchs didn't really use that extensively. He spent the time there, of course, being crowned at the end of October, which was a prerequisite to the establishment of his first parliament, and remained in London to see that first parliament through to the end. And it's at that point, we're getting into February 1486, He's already married, of course, Elizabeth of York at the end of January. He's conducted his first parliament. He's been crowned. He's steadied the ship in London. And he's ready now to go and address some other issues elsewhere in the country. (laughs) Some other issues, I say, raise my eyebrow. (laughs) Fantastic. I always, you know, Sarah, it's funny because I always feel so at home in Henry VIII's reign and any other kind of reign feels a little bit foreign to me, but I am glad that we're talking about Henry VII because I think that's really important. And so you've talked about some of the things going on, you know, after he takes over from Richard III. So what do we know about the context of the actual progress? Are there any other important events happening that we need to know about that are going to let us have a more in-depth understanding of the 1486 progress? Yeah, absolutely. So, as I said, he secured the capital, but that didn't mean the rest of the country had accepted the new Tudor monarch and the new dynasty. Of course, there were still people who were fiercely loyal to the House of York, and nowhere was this more so in the troublesome north 
of England. Of course, Henry VIII would later call the north of England root and beastly, and perhaps Henry VII could have applied the same adjectives uh, to the north. And of course, uh, up in the north, in Yorkshire in particular, that had always been a Yorkist stronghold. We have Midland Castle, the birthplace of Richard III, also the place in which his son died. And so staunchly Yorkist, we've got the city of York, of course, as well, very much affiliated with the Yorkist kings and Richard III. He'd had his son proclaimed Prince of Wales in the city of York. And so so it's a hotbed of dissent. And I think what Henry wants to do at this point is to head north to show himself to the people and to quell any pockets of dissent that are bubbling up around the northern parts of his realm. So quite wisely, he sets together a progress that sets out from London uh, in March of 1486 to do exactly that. He's a shrewd guy, is Henry, and you already see how in these very early weeks and months, he's just enacting his royal role to perfection and seemingly making all the right decisions at the right time. Yeah, I was just thinking it's obviously a very wise move, but also a very bold move um, on his part, because, of course, it must have been dangerous. He's just, you know, for some people in the north, he's obviously murdered their rightful king and off he goes progressing through their through their town. So that is quite impressive. So Sarah, when you're writing about progresses, do you follow a similar pattern? Because you've obviously looked at lots of different locations or what's the process for you? The first bit is to get really excited. <laughs> well, we do that all the time, don't we? We're talking about the tutors. I get this tingling sense of anticipation when I'm about to start writing about any new location, but particularly a progress. So the first thing is to find out the source of, of how are we going to know about the places that were visited on this progress. Now, when we wrote about the 1535 progress, we extensively used the household accounts and the letters and papers of Henry VIII. Unfortunately, one of the challenging things, and this is why the reign of Henry VII historically hasn't been covered, although I think latterly there's been some great biographies on him, but because there's much less contemporary evidence available. However, for this particular um, progress, we do have the Herald's account for the majority of it, and that is the main source. So that's the first thing I'm interested. Where is the main contemporary source or sources? And I usually map out the entire progress So writing down all the list of the places that are mentioned and then usually doing a kind of a first level check of do we know exactly where they stayed or is this one of these locations where we're going to have to do a lot more digging, maybe even a little bit of guesswork and intuition based on uh, what I've learned over the years about where royal households tend to stay. So Once I've got my kind of first pass idea of what I'm about to tackle, it's then really about uh, looking at locations one by one. And at that stage, yes, of course, I'm interested in understanding the context of the visit to each location, because I guess, as we may well hear about, even on this progress, stuff happens <laughs> and um and usually something interesting is going on even though from the majority of progresses particularly later they're more pleasure progresses of course henry was a man on a mission here he had a very specific purpose in mind and we'll see some of that unfolding as we go along so i am interested in in getting a feel for the context and the history and the events that are going on but i think this is where you and i experience this with the 1535 progress and so it continues our focus is really as i was saying earlier on on about really trying to set the scene by talking about the places by finding out as much as I can about each location as it appeared at the time. I love engaging my imagination during these adventures in time, as I call them. And I'm hoping, of course, that people not only want to enjoy this from the comfort of their armchair, but there will be people who want to go out and visit these places for real. And so one of my aims when I'm writing about each of the locations is not only to find the place, but I think, or we know the monarch stayed, but to recreate it as vividly as possible as it would have been during the visit, 
But of course, as we did in our In the Footsteps books, I also want to give people visitor information about what they can go and see, which is why I try and usually manage to visit almost every location that I go to on progress so that I can sort of point out where people need to go, what do they look out for, what they must not miss if they're going on their own little mini adventure. So that's that's generally the process. There are other sources, of course, that I draw upon. There are some very useful books that are written almost pre-industrial revolution that might not be contemporary records, but nevertheless often give us an account of what a place looked like very often before it was lost to industrialization. And so they they can be extremely useful with some lovely illustrations that you can find. And sometimes they're the earliest illustrations that we have. And then, of course, there's local historians, history societies and archives who often, if there is a local place of note, the local history society will be the one that knows probably more about it than any historian who writes about biographies generally speaking. So they're a wealth of information and I always make sure I plunder them if appropriate. Fantastic. And uh, I still remember how exciting that feeling was where you're you're looking at a location and you find that there's something still left to see. That is a wonderful feeling, isn't it? Oh gosh, it so is. And I think the most satisfying ones, bizarrely, are ones that are almost completely lost and have been lost to sort of current memory. People have stopped talking about them and we'll see that perhaps we'll come to talk about Doncaster is a great example on this progress of exactly that. Or you've you think there's nothing. Your first pass doesn't show much. And I know you'll appreciate this, Natalie, but you dig and you dig and you dig. Find a source that just starts to unravel the whole story. And that's just, it's just so satisfying, isn't it? Absolutely. So you're doing all this in-depth research. Did anything in particular become evident? And you've touched on this a little bit about Henry's kingship from these early days of his reign. Yeah, I loved this about Henry. It's so clear that despite the fact that he has spent a lot of his time abroad in exile, he's clearly been studying the art of kingship. He did spend a little bit of time in the French court just prior to setting sail for England, where he would you know, fight at the Battle of Bosworth. So he saw something of the French court and the grandeur of you know, the French palaces. Um, but This was a man who clearly, through the sequence of decisions, knew his own mind. He was very decisive. He was also very generous to people who'd supported him, as you might expect. He was also very ruthless to those who who were not supportive of the new regime. And I think, I don't know about you, but I think one of the uh, one of the decisions that I think is is another really bold decision is the fact that he backdates his reign to the day before Bosworth. And so anybody who thought there was effectively a traitor, I thought that was a bit harsh. I don't know about you, Natalie. <laughs> Yeah, incredibly clever, though, because he could hang that over everyone and kind of say, be loyal or this is what's going to happen. Yeah. So he he enacted these decisions very clearly, very decisively. But also what I was intrigued to find and saw throughout this progress was how he was very well aware of the traditions and ceremony associated with being a monarch and being a monarch of England. And right the way through This progress, we see him enacting the monarch's role, for example, at Easter, Lincoln. Again, we we may come back to talk about that a little bit more. If there's any ceremony that has been enacted by a previous king of England, you'll find Henry right there in the thick of it, dressed to the nines. He knew how to dress. He knew how to spend money. I know he's well known as being, um, you know, sort of frugal, but he knew how to look like a king. He knew how to act like a king. And and that was as as important as being a king when it came to the populace. People wanted somebody who who looked like it, who acted the part. And he was he was exceptional at that. He also showed his piety as well. And again, we may see this, I think, through some of his actions uh, through this progress. But this is what came to me over and over again. He may have been 28. He may have had no experience of kingship. He may have only visited the English court once, I think when he was a teenager, to see inside the royal palaces. 
but he seemed to he was well supported of course by his mother Margaret Beaufort and and then of course by his wife who who'd had a lot of experience of the English court but he seemed to have a way about him a character a knack which enabled him to fill that role and to be very aware of what was expected of him as a king and so, Sarah, let's talk a little bit about the specifics of this particular progress. We've given the context. You've given lots of really great insights into Henry and his how he was ruling at this point. But where, do you, where does he lead from? Where does he go? Can you tell us a bit more about the actual itinerary? Yeah, of course. So um, he sets off from London, as you would expect. He's based in London. Um, he sets off from um, the Priory of St. John in Clerkenwell, which is an interesting place. I know it's it's a place you've looked into as well in the past. It was an unusual priory in that it was it was part of the Knights Hospitaller uh, movement who uh, owed their allegiance to a very ancient foundation based in the Holy Land. Their, their raison d'etre was to protect and care for those who were visiting the Holy Land, no matter what kind of faith or denomination. And they essentially the Priory of St. John was their UK or I should say their English headquarters at the time and particularly it had very strong associations with the crown so it was a very wealthy monastic foundation and whenever there was wealth you could be sure that the crown was schmoozing up and that was exactly the case with St John's Priory. It had clearly hosted royal visitors over time, it had lavish accommodation so not surprising, perhaps, that Henry would lodge himself there. And geographically, it's in the right place to head north. It's in the north of London. It's close to the Great North Road and to Ermine Street. And that's where Henry would leave along Ermine Street, heading north. He goes via Cambridge, eventually uh, up to Lincoln, where he spends Easter. We'll perhaps talk about some of the events at Lincoln, uh, because he then heads westward towards Nottingham and before turning north through Doncaster, Pontefract, and up to his destination, and most northerly destination, I should say, in York. It's not actually his final destination. He does then loop back down, back down through Nottingham, through the Midlands, through places like Hereford and Worcester, down to Bristol before he comes back, uh, heading again eastwards to meet with Elizabeth of York at Richmond. However, for my progress, I've actually just focused on the outward leg of his progress. So the part of the progress that takes him from St. John's Priory up to York. So Elizabeth doesn't join him on this progress, does she? No, she doesn't. No, she's already pregnant by this uh, time and uh, he leaves her behind at London. Uh, unlike the next progress I'm writing about, which is the 1502 progress. Oh, I like that one too. I like that one too. So Lincoln, you've mentioned Lincoln a few times. He could have obviously headed north more directly. So why does he go to Lincoln? Yeah, so there is a couple of interesting uh, points about the northern leg of the the first part that takes him up to Lincoln. Uh, He first stops at Waltham Abbey. I'll just mention that because it's a really holy site that's been deeply associated with the crown since the early days of the medieval period. It has the Holy Cross. It's a place that we see venerated by English kings over centuries. And I think there's no coincidence that Henry goes and pays his respects to Waltham Abbey before heading via Cambridge up to Lincoln. At Lincoln, there are two main events on the ceremonial calendar that take place through the course of this progress. The first is one we've just had, in fact, Easter. And Easter, he reaches Lincoln in time to celebrate Easter. The other one is the Garter Day in April, in mid-April which he clearly aims to be at York for that. And so the two big cities where he spends over a week in each, Lincoln and York, are both associated with two great ceremonial, both religious and kind of court ceremonial days. And he clearly wants these cities to be the theatre for those events to take place. And so he does divert to Lincoln. You're quite right. It's not the most direct route. Uh, If you were heading north and you wanted to go straight to York, you would use the Great North Road, which today still exists by and large in the form of the A1. It's still the same, one of the main routes north. Thankfully, it's been resurfaced, (laughs) but he doesn't. He diverts both to Cambridge and then to Lincoln. And so we see the great festival of Easter taking place. And boy, 
does Henry make a spectacle of it? Yeah, so he's trying to enhance his majesty, isn't he, at these very, very important locations. So interesting. So, you know, things don't always go smoothly on these progresses, Sarah. So what are some of the things that happen while he's progressing north? Yeah, so here we have um, Henry arrives at Lincoln with all the usual pomp and ceremony um, associated with the royal arrival in the city. He's there for the Maundy Thursday celebrations, the blessing of cramp rings. Uh, cramp rings were literally rings that the king gave out, through, mostly through the medica- medieval period. It seemed to have fallen into abeyance sort of after the Reformation, um, but it was to protect against epilepsy. Um, so he's there to enact these very public ceremonies. He stays in the Bishop's Palace, which if you've ever been to Lincoln, you'll know is directly adjacent to the most glorious cathedral, one of my absolute favourite cathedrals in England, Lincoln. And he goes every day in public to Mass. He doesn't use the private chapel of the bishops, which he could have done. No, no, no. He wants to be seen. And so every single day he processes to hear High Mass in the cathedral. But going back to your point, while he's in Lincoln, rumours are abound that further sort of insurrection and revolt are gathering pace. We have Francis Viscount Lovell and Humphrey Stafford escaping or leaving their sanctuary at Colchester, which is where they've been since the Battle of Bosworth. And the Stafford brothers head off to Worcester, the idea being that they're going to stir up trouble in the Midlands. And Francis Lovell heads north to North Yorkshire with the rumours that he is going to raise an army against Henry and take Henry while he's at York. So these are really real threats at the time. And I think I've heard you say this, you know, now we can look back and we know the outcome. We know there wasn't an issue. But then it was, you know, The memory of Bosworth was still very strong in everybody's minds and this insurrection and this threat to the throne was real. So Henry hears about these rumours when he's at Lincoln. And again, he acts decisively. He called upon a number of different nobles, including George Stanley, Lord Strange, Sir William Stanley and John de Vere, Earl of Oxford, to meet with him at Nottingham Castle, which is a hugely important strategic and defensive point in the Midlands that really was the frontier of defence between the north and the south because it basically dominated a major river crossing at the River Trent there. Uh, So it was strategically incredibly important and he mustered his men to meet in there, no doubt to plot a strategy of how they were going to cope with the rumours that they were hearing. So that all happened in Lincoln. Henry stayed about a week there before he packed up and headed towards Nottingham. Wonderful. And there's obviously all these different locations that that you've written about. So was there one that had the most information or one that you found most enjoyable to to write about, either because of what remains today or because of what happened while while the court was there? Yes, yes. It's always a favourite, I think, (laughs) although it's difficult because I do fall in love with all of them. When I'm writing about every single one, oh, I love this one. (laughs) This is my favourite. But, I mean... York probably has to be the pinnacle of the progress. It certainly was the pinnacle of the progress for Henry. And I love it for at least a couple of reasons. The first is my home county is North Yorkshire. And so um, I was brought up not too far from York, have visited many, many times. And I'm well aware of its medieval and Tudor charms. If you haven't visited York, then I urge you to, if you're coming over to the UK, to to plan your own uh, adventure in time up to the city of York. You've been, haven't you, Nat? It's it's, it's just a I actually spent 10 days there and still did not get to see everything that I wanted to see. So there's a lot to do in York. Yeah, it's one of the best preserved medieval cities, um, the heart of the old city and a lot of the very sort of cramped medieval streets with the timber framed houses and the ancient what we call snickleways. Oh, I love the snickleways. (laughs) 
<laughs> which is a very local term for little alleyways that connected streets. Yeah, it's 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 a wonderful location to visit. So just from a visitor perspective, as you said, you spent 10 days there. There's so many places to see churches, houses, the Minster, of course, yes. um, which is the centerpiece. It was the centerpiece when Henry visited in 1486, and it's still the centerpiece of the city. So that's one reason. It's just a wonderful city, uh, a time capsule, a fabulous place to visit. And from a researcher's point of view, is not only do we have the Herald's record, we've got the kind of the corporation record of the, uh, the records from the city itself. So we now suddenly have two sources of information and boy do they record the visit in some detail and I love hearing the details so as we know with any royal entry into any city actually happened at Lincoln there's records of it at Lincoln there's records of it at Nottingham on this progress and certainly records at York we have the whole ceremony of being meet you know meeting the monarch outside of the city sort of three or four miles outside of the city the great and the good of York going out meeting the king at Tadcaster he then progresses a bit further then he's met by another group of folk um, about half a mile outside of the city walls he's met by the religious um, you know, the brothers, the friars of the various different monastic institutions in York. There's all sorts of speeches made, welcoming, you know, that, you know, sort of the groveling that goes on. But for me, in this instance, the North had a history of doing this, of course, later with Henry VIII. They had to do the same thing when Henry VIII visited in 1541 following the Pilgrimage of Grace. But here we have the city really staging a whole series of pageants as Henry makes his way ceremoniously through the streets of York. And because we have this account, Natalie, we know exactly the route he took from the moment he arrived at Tadcaster Bridge to the moment he arrived at his lodgings in the Archbishop's Palace, which is several miles. We know exactly the streets that he travelled down and the pageants that were staged, the speeches that were given. Wow, and I love this little detail. One of the main streets in York, Coney Street, the city had built galleries between the medieval houses because, you know, anybody who's seen a medieval street will know how you have these tall houses and they tend to get closer towards the top. Well, they built galleries connecting the houses above the street and they used the medieval version, Tudor version of ticker tape. <laughs> and so that would have all been fluttering down upon Henry as he made his progression uh, through the streets. He was wearing, we even have that, cloth of gold lined with ermine. So he had his very best threads on for the occasion, unsurprisingly. And yeah, we just have such an immense amount of detail, including his arrival at the cathedral. The usual kissing of the cross when the monarch arrives at the great cathedral doors and how he processed in. He heard mass. He then went to the shrine of St. William. Um, and then heard the Te Deum song before finally going to his lodgings at the Archbishop's Palace, which lies or lay, I should say, because it's virtually lost now, sadly, just adjacent to the Minster. I love all those details. It's, it just brings it to life completely, doesn't it? And I love that those traditions, which were obviously already ancient by then, continue throughout Henry's reign and we see it you know in the progress that we looked at 1535 they're doing the same thing essentially when they arrive they are doing, in these cities they are doing the same thing and that's such an important point I think you and I learned that fairly early on how these ceremonies are repeated I saw it when I cut away wrote about um the huge party at Canterbury Cathedral when Charles V the Holy Roman Emperor came over just prior to the field of cloth of cold exactly the same procedure of the monarch being met at the boundary of the city and then sometimes met a little bit closer about half a mile out by the religious brethren, and then all these pageants being staged. And then they almost always made their way to the cathedral of the city, as far as I can make out. And you have the dismounting of the horse, the kneeling on cushions, kissing of the cross, and then processing inside to hear mass. And so, yes, that does seem to be virtually unchanged, certainly over the period that I've been looking at. 
Okay, so we've talked about York, which obviously has a lot of interesting sources for you to explore and, and lots of places to still visit today. But what do you think is one of the locations that's least well known? Oh, I mentioned this before, Doncaster. I mean, certainly if you're a UK citizen, and I do apologise to anybody who was born in or lives in Doncaster, but you don't think Doncaster and tourist destination are known for its medieval buildings. Unfortunately, this part of Yorkshire was really annihilated during the Industrial Revolution. It was a powerhouse for England, um, or one of the areas that were powerhouse of England during the Industrial Revolution. So sadly, so much of the sort of ancient landscape um, in some of these large Yorkshire cities in West and South Yorkshire were unfortunately largely destroyed. And Doncaster is one of such victim, I think. Now, I have to hold my hands up and admit I have not been to this location yet, but I am determined to stop by, even though I know there's absolutely nothing to see except a modern day shopping precinct. Um, that's all we have left. But once upon a time, certainly during uh, this period, the Great North Road went directly through Doncaster, right through the city centre. And the, the high street today was originally the Great North Road, and it was called Hallgate at the time. And Doncaster wasn't a walled town, but it had gates. You know, the gates that allowed that, that sort of usually were at the sort of four at least four points of the compass. And Donkas had gates, but apparently, according to our dear friend John Leyland, who is our 16th century antiquarian, who is also a fantastic source of information, not specifically about, of course, this progress, but how Tudor England looked. Um, and he describes the town comprised of mostly sort of timber frame building, but there was some stone and slate as well. But there was a friary. Uh, in Doncaster, and it was the White Friars, because of the nature of the gowns that they wore. Uh, it was Carmelite Friary, uh, situated to the south of the town. The important part about that friary is it had a very, very significant shrine. In fact, it was the most important Marian shrine in Yorkshire. Uh, it had noble patronage, so I think it was founded by John of Gaunt. The friary was found, founded by John of Gaunt in 1350. I think also Richard II uh, very much was a patron of the friary. And it had a great record of royal visits, as you might imagine, because any monarch heading through to the north, through to York and beyond, would probably be going up the Great North Road and therefore would probably go through Doncaster. And of course, this is a hugely holy site. So the perfect opportunity, and this is exactly the case again with Henry VII, to stop, to hear mass, give offerings at the shrine, to show their piety and religious devotion, all part of being kingship. Again, harking back to what I was saying earlier about Henry playing out this role to perfection. And there are very definite records of him staying at the shrine. He'd all, that shrine had also been visited by uh, Edward IV and would be visited. And uh, the friary would be the place of accommodation for Henry's daughter, Margaret Tudor, when she was on her way to Scotland, to, obviously to become the Scottish Queen. So it's quite touching, I think, when you see actually Margaret stays at a few of the locations that her father stayed at sort of some 20 years or so beforehand. And um, yeah, I find that rather touching, don't you? Just thinking about what she must have been thinking about. Absolutely. And that's another fascinating journey, Sarah. There's another <laughs> to look at. That, that is definitely on my I'm list. Not giving you any it's... more work, but that that is an interesting that's one. It's going to be a monster, though, isn't it? Because it there is. are we know, we know pretty much every location Absolutely. on that particular journey. So that's going to be a monster. But I am looking forward to it. I've wanted to write about that for some time. But anyway, I'm just saying that um, the friary Henry heard mass there. He also, I think, progressed across the town to the parish church of Saint George again to be seen by the populace. Um, unfortunately, both the friary and the church were completely destroyed for different reasons. St George's Church burnt to the ground in 1853, taking with it a medieval library above the porch, which oh, is God. just heartbreaking. <laughs> and the friary, obviously, it was dissolved, as all friaries were, and eventually, I imagine, robbed out, decayed. And there were still, interestingly, there was a big archaeological project done there, I think it was in the 19th century and they found an underground tunnel, which was probably not a sewer, but a, a tunnel that connected one part of the uh, Priory. 
but it's all now being covered over by modern houses and well shops really yeah sad but so I think you know that's one of those places that was probably incredibly important for religious reasons um had a lot of royal patronage but has completely gone that's always heartbreaking when you have to use a lot of imagination sometimes in some <laughs> of these locations. So, Sarah, yes, I know do. I know from, you know, researching places myself and doing a lot of research that there are moments that can be very frustrating. <laughs> so what were those moments for you or what locations caused you to want to, like, kind of rip your hair out of your head? <laughs> oh, well, you know, partly I just wanted to say to the Herald who was travelling with the party, please, could you have not given me some more details on this? So, you know, he starts off, I think it's some the, one of the first entries is the king leaves St John's Priory. He travels to Waltham Abbey and then via the highway to Cambridge, where he is most honourably received. I'm like, that's three locations you've covered in one sentence. Please give me more, man. Um, but he didn't, unfortunately. And Cambridge was one of those. And oh, I was just determined. First of all, I wanted to know what was the highway. I was like, what, what? What's the highway? What was the highway? And the answer is, I don't know for sure. But I think basically when Henry left London, he travelled up the old Ermine Street to begin with. I think he only joined the Great North Road a little bit later at Stamford and Huntingdon. It's the A10 today <laughs> that heads out of London up towards Waltham Abbey and then sort of on to Cambridge. So I think he went in that direction. And I wonder whether it was Ermine Street that they were talking about when they talked about the highway, but I don't know for sure. But then we have nothing about where he stayed at Cambridge. So that was really frustrating, but I was determined to find something and try and find what you and I call form, a place that has form. So I'll say up front, I couldn't find for certain where Henry stayed, but I had a jolly good guess. So um, what we do have is when you start looking at the records from Cambridge, there is something called the Grace Book Alpha, which does record a couple of things about the King's visit that I think it was bread, beer and victuals were provided, as was some wax and some um, paper for, you know, it sounds like somebody wanted to write something down. Um, so I don't know, we're going to keep a journal. So, and also a present was given to my Lord the King. So we have, with a little bit more digging, I was able to find out a tiny bit more information about what happened, but I was still left not knowing where he stayed. But with Cambridge, I think you can make a really good story of why he went and a good guess at where he might have stayed. So a few reasons. First of all, the Yorkist kings had been to Cambridge on five separate occasions with Richard III visiting just the year before he caught Bosworth. And again, we go back to I kept seeing this happen with Henry. If the Yorkist kings had been there and done it, he wanted to be there and do it. And I presume it was, again, just a way of stamping his authority as the new and rightful monarch. So that's one aspect. The second was his half uncle, step uncle, um, Henry VI, had, although seen as quite an inept, weak ruler, was very pious. And he had begun to found King's College at Cambridge. And we would see in time Henry VII pouring money into the uh, completion of that project. And although it wouldn't actually be finally completed until the reign of his son, Henry VIII, he provided a lot of money in order to continue the work of his Lancastrian ancestor. And, and I think anybody who knows anything about this time knows that the Tudors, the early Tudors, did quite a lot to raise up the profile of Henry the sixth and and actually make moves to have him canonized so there was a lot of tudor propaganda going on there and i could well appreciate why henry might have wanted to pick up that work that had been started scholarly and pious work started by his lancastrian ancestor and then finally of course we have his own mother who was very closely associated with Cambridge. Um, she was one of the patrons of Cambridge University and she would visit with Henry on two other occasions, including in 1506, where there are full accounts of what happened and where Henry stayed. So this is where I move into my guesswork a little bit, Natalie. 
But the accounts give the same kind of reception that we would associate with any reception in a city. And we have the king staying at Queen's College. And in that instance, it is definitely mentioned in the records that he stays at Queen's College and he processes across to the King's College Chapel, which is only half built at this stage, to hear the Mass. And I do wonder, because you and I have come across this, haven't we, when we are writing about a place, we're looking for a building that has what we call form, when we were writing our In the Footsteps book, that was lavish enough, sizable enough, had a history of hosting royal visits. And so while I can't say for certain that's where he stayed, I'm, I'm guessing that that could well have been one of the locations that we must have in the frame for the 1486 visit. And Sarah, if some of our listeners, they must be just as enthusiastic as us and want to pack their bags and, and go and visit a couple of locations from this particular progress, which would you recommend? Maybe if they've only got time to see a couple, which do you think are the sort of best locations to visit? We've mentioned two of them already. Without doubt, York and Lincoln. <laughs> they were high spots for Henry the Seventh. Why not high spots for us as well? But they are beautiful cities and they have at their centre still both of them have a surviving old city. There's the old city of Lincoln, which sits high up on the hill, adjacent to the cathedral. You have, I, as I said before, I think Lincoln is in my top three places, cathedrals in England. It's stunning. You've got the ruins of the Archbishop's Palace, which have been closed for a couple of years now because English Heritage have been doing work on them. But I'm hoping at some point soon they will reopen. And if you visit there, you can, even if you can't get in, you can stand on the outside, you can see the Great Hall where it's likely that Henry did the washing of the four men's feet on Monday, Thursday. Um, you've got the lovely gateway leading into the cathedral precinct. You've got the castle, which is directly across, um, almost like the sort of the, the main marketplace from the cathedral area. And a couple of lovely sort of higgledy-piggledy, oldie-worldy streets with lots of lovely coffee shops. So that's always going to make it onto my agenda. <laughs> so I love I would just say to folk, if you do stay, make sure you stay close to the cathedral because it is high up on a hill and the modern town is down right at the foot of the hill and there's a very long, steep climb. So if you're in any way impaired in your mobility, make sure that you stay in the old town close to the cathedral. And then York, of course, wonderful, lovely York, um, which has so much to offer. If anybody's interested in seeing some of my top spots on video, they could Google the Tudor Travel Guide and York. And one of my videos, which features sort of five, I think it's five or six of the best places to go and visit in York with Tudor connections are on there. So you could see some of the places that we're talking about. There's the Minster, the remnants of the Archbishop's Palace, the Chapel still survives, although pretty much everything else, sadly, is gone. Uh, you've got Barley Hall, which is a reconstruction of a medieval uh, a medieval townhouse. You've got the Hall of the Merchants Adventurers, which was the largest secular building in England when it was built, I think, in the mid 14th century, and is still owned by the same guild that, that built the hall in the first instance, which is just mind blowing. And then, of course, there's just a myriad of little lovely little streets and churches to, to and the gates as well and the walls of York. We can't not mention the fact that York has probably the most complete set of medieval walls left. And I think all of its gates are still standing as well, all four of its gates. So and you can get in and, and explore those um, and walk the walls. So lots and lots and lots to see in York. And please, this is my this is my request. Don't please book yourself one day, day trip from London to go and see York. You can get to London on the main Northern Railway that runs north to York in a day. You'll probably have about two hours. You'll be kicking yourself uh, because you'll realise how much you haven't seen. I would give yourself at least two days. What do you think, Natalie? Yes, I think to get at least a good taste of it. But like I said, I was there 10 days and was still left wanting. So, you know, maybe a few days, a long weekend or something like that. That would be that would be ideal, I think. 
Uh, so Sarah, what is next? You're, you're like me. We always have lots of projects on the go. So <laughs> what is happening in your world? Uh, ne- never a dull moment. Well, um, the main thing I'm now preoccupied with is my new membership that I mentioned at the top of the podcast. So the ultimate guide to exploring Tudor England. I've really been inspired really by the work of John Leyland, our 16th century antiquarian who wandered around England in the 1530s, just recording what he saw. And it kind of strikes me that folk like you and I are modern day antiquarians. We we want to wander around and we are both reimagining what places look like in the past, but also trying to tell people about what to go and see and, and, and recording what's there today. And so my kind of purpose that's really inspired me to create this membership site is a long-term project, which I see lasting, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. This is something I'm dedicating and committing my time to, to bring together as much information as I can about exploring Tudor England, i.e. its history and the people through the places and the locations that are left behind. So I've pulled together a new membership. Um, it's for armchair travellers and real-time travellers alike. A lot of people who follow the Tudor Travel Guide particularly were saying to me, yes, we love detailed descriptions of places. Please keep those coming. But also, can you give us itineraries? We want itineraries. And so I've got two levels of membership, armchair travellers who simply want to read in detail about Tudor places and locations, a little bit like our In the Footsteps book. Um, And so I've got a building library of those, including this library of Tudor progresses that I'm going to be writing about over time. And then for people who want to travel and visit, I've got a whole plethora of resources around itineraries of all sorts of different durations sorted by time you might have available, which geographic part of the country you're in, or the progress is according to Tudor personalities of the age. And also a whole new resource on Tudor tombs. So I am cataloguing Tudor tombs um, in detail and also a, a library of historic places to stay. So if you want to put the icing on the cake of your Tudor adventure here in the UK by staying in somewhere that is steeped in medieval and Tudor history. We're building up a library of those. And then finally, within that, there's also a community board where we can meet and connect and maybe even find a travel buddy. And uh, we also do some live classes and master classes in there, depending on what level of membership. So as you can see, Natalie, alongside my podcast, the Tudor History and Travel Show, which I kind of do for fun, this is soaking up a lot of my time now, but it's gone really well, had some fantastic feedback. And I just really love the fact that this is just going to be, we're just at the beginning. It's certainly not the end. <laughs> That sounds absolutely amazing. And I imagine that there's people listening, thinking, okay, I I need to join this community. So where do they go? What do they do, Sarah? So membership opens periodically because I want to onboard new people into the membership. So what I'm doing is periodically about every eight weeks, I'm opening membership for about two weeks at a time. And I'm going to be doing a live chat during that membership period where I can show people around the site. So I really wanted to be able to just show people around and get people settled in so they can find their way around and make most of the site. So what I'm going to do, if it's okay with you, Natalie, is give you a link to the sign up page for the membership. Um, I think when this goes live, we will hopefully be in a period where membership is open. So you'll be able to follow the link, you'll be able to see two membership levels available, choose which one is right for right for you and sign up. And then hopefully join me in some of my live chats and my live masterclasses and on the community board where we can all get to know each other. That sounds absolutely wonderful. I love it. And there is one more thing, Sarah, that I need to ask you that I ask all my guests. And that is for a Tudor takeaway. So something for our listeners. You've given us a lot, but something for our listeners to go off and explore after the show. Do you have a takeaway for us? Well, I think it should relate to what we've been talking about. And I'd like to, um, because I've also been talking about visiting and exploring places and historic accommodation. I was thinking that maybe I could point people towards a property that was once owned by the Archbishops of York. Harwood Castle. Now you may be thinking Harwood Castle, I know that name. And if you are, that's because that's where um, Thomas Wolsey was arrested uh, when he had, when he was sort of in exile uh, from court. So 
The palace had an amazing uh, royal pedigree. It was visited by all sorts of members of royalty, including Richard III, Edward IV, of course, uh, Henry VIII and Catherine Howard were there and Thomas Wolsey. Sadly, a lot of the palace is gone, but one range survives and the gatehouse is being converted into a place to stay. So it's run by the Landmark Trust. And if you went onto the Landmark Trust website and you looked at Howard, which is C A W O D Castle, you will be able to see that. And I did get a chance to get and have a sneaky peek in there one time. And you can get on the roof. It's got a nice view. So I can imagine sitting out there. The sun ever comes out. And <laughs> enjoying the views across the Yorkshire countryside. Wow, what a wonderful takeaway. And I think, I don't think we've had that one in, you know, nearing 200 episodes. So well done, Sarah. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming back on the podcast and telling us about all these wonderful things and for talking Tudors with us. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invite. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, such a pleasure to see you again, Natalie, and to chat with you and your, and your listeners. I hope people get some chance to go and explore some of the places. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.